Hey, it's Chick Chang, back with the third and final part of Halo The Fall of Reach. If you haven't seen part one or two, check the links below and you can start from the top. Without further delay, let's begin. We start with Dr. Halsey conversing with Deja for a bit about possibilities coming from the intercepted transmission caught by Captain Keys. Either it's a new dialect from the Covenant or a whole new alien race. Forerunners, quote unquote. Neither is a good answer as far as Oni Brass was concerned. Soon after that, we get a first look at Cortana, who is the quirky smart AI that has Oni's best intrusive software. And when she's bored, she puts it to test. Halsey tells her that Mjolnir was approved and that she can pick which Spartan to be paired with. Not much time passes and she chooses Spartan 117, John of course. To which Halsey is hesitant at first, but does agree that it is the best match. It's interesting too, because they point out that John was never the fastest, strongest, or smartest of any of the Spartans. However, he was always the bravest and the luckiest. And in her opinion, the best of the Spartans. Then we get to more of their planning for the mission, needing a ship, which they choose the Pillar of Autumn, some may recognize from Halo 1, which only leaves one more thing to decide, the captain of this ship, to which Halsey tells her she already has Captain Keys picked out for the job. Cortana is a bit put aback due to Keys pulling off amazing strategic victories without an AI, but Halsey assures her that Keys' first refit request was an onboard AI. Plus, Keys has the one thing that is hard to find. He can keep a secret. A couple days later, John and the rest of the Spartans are in the briefing room. Dr. Halsey walks in with Captain Keys and explains the new mission they have. The objective is to capture a prophet of the Covenant, which nobody knows what it looks like or what they are, or where they are at. But in order to deal with that, they are going to find and capture a Covenant ship and take it to their home planet. After getting that, they will need to capture, not kill a prophet, and bring it back to UNSC space, which at this point they will try to create a truce with the Covenant. They are told that they will have assets to help pilot the Covenant vessel, since nobody really knows how they work. John is a bit worried, thinking that whatever asset it could be would be a liability in a fight. But John had learned to trust Dr. Halsey, and at the end, she tells him that Vice Admiral Stanforth is asking for volunteers, since it's an extremely high-risk mission. Every Spartan stood. Halsey smiles and tells them that she will meet with them individually and show them Mjolnir. Later, John had arrived at the combat training facility to be the first to test Mjolnir. He got an upgrade to his neural interface. While following Halsey, he noticed that 10 ODSTs were standing guard. He wondered why Helljumpers would be there. In the next room, a suit of power armor stood. John knew it wasn't his, since his was dented and turned to brown from years of use. Halsey tells him it's what the armor should be, and proceeds to put it on. John goes through some testing, learning that the new armor has shielding, which was a huge breakthrough. She also tells him that the suit can house an AI. Halsey inserts a chip, and John meets Cortana for the first time. To John, Cortana sounds very civilian, and Halsey tells him that she has some behavioral quirks that he will have to get used to. At this point, they get ready to start the combat training. Halsey tells him to get to the other side and ring a bell. He is authorized to neutralize any opposition, and also to be careful because some people would like him to fail this exercise. John says he won't fail and they get ready. John waits 10 seconds before leaving the platform to engage the ODSTs that are trying to flank him. He neutralizes all of them without killing them quite easily. Cortana asks why, since he was authorized to do so, but John doesn't want to waste lives, where he doesn't have to, so even though they are trying to kill him, he doesn't really need to kill them. John engages other groups, and again, easily dispatches them. He actually saves a few by kicking a grenade, one of them dropped away so they didn't blow him up. Next in the exercise is a Lotus tank mine field. John asks Cortana for ideas, and she gives him a 93% accurate map based on two mines he set off. Without a problem, he gets through the field, until he reached a stretch that had three turrets ready to open fire on him. He makes it to one and uses it to destroy the other two, detonating grenades to finish them off. Cortana hears some chatter on SATCOM, so she leaves to check it out. When she comes back, she tells him a Skyhawk jump jet is inbound to their position. John knew he couldn't take that on with what he had. While on top of wooden poles in the current section of, of the course, he saw the jet coming in. He jumped down and laid flat against the earth, getting hit by a few rounds, but other than that, he was just fine. The shields were taken down to about half, which was a big improvement from the last suit that would have been penetrated and he probably would have been dead. Cortana told him he had 11 seconds till the jet made another pass. John knew that they would use missiles next time and didn't want to flee the field, but he wanted to win by their rules. So he ran for a few seconds and then told Cortana he would need her help. He wanted her to calculate the velocity of the missiles from the jet, factor his reaction time, and tell him when to move his arm to deflect the missile away from them, since they couldn't outrun it or dodge it. It was the only option. So they do just that, having it detonate a few meters away and launching him six meters the opposite direction. He gets up, shields drained, but starting to refill and blood across the inside of his helmet. Cortana yelled for him to run, so he takes off after the bell. He crosses a half kilometer stretch in 17 seconds, tearing his Achilles in the process. It's about 66 miles an hour that he was able to run. Once he reached the bell and rang it, he hears Halsey congratulate him and call off the jet. He looked down and realized that it was the same bell he rang on the first day of boot camp. John then thanks Cortana and tells her that he couldn't have done it without her. A little bit later, we are on the Pillar of Autumn with Cortana, who is doing her normal duties and getting the ship right to go. 
This doesn't take much of her core processing power, however, so she will satisfy her time by doing things most wish she didn't. She got back at Colonel Ackerson for trying to kill them during the training mission, since he was the main dude trying to make them fail. He went above and beyond what Halsey originally wanted to do, since Ackerson hated the Spartan 2 program, since it outdid his own military programs. So she filed transfer papers for him to get him back in the front lines where he belonged. She dug into John's files, too, to find out more about him, but she couldn't find really much of anything before he joined the program. Cortana then read through the files, trying to find out anything that was out of the ordinary. John fought in 207 ground engagements and had been awarded every single medal except for the Prisoner of War medallion. She then read all of the augmentations the Spartans went through and saw that they were approved by Dr. Halsey. She didn't understand how she could be so concerned for her Spartans but do these things to them. She vowed to never let anything bad happen to John again as long as it didn't compromise the mission. At the same time, Keyes is talking with Hikawa about the ship. There were 40 50 millimeter cannons for surface defense all along the ship with the Mac gun firing three rounds on one charge, along with some other upgrades in other areas. Keyes asks about the armored pelican in the bay, and Hakawa tells him that it's specially made for the Spartans, not realizing that they were already on board. So he wants to go down and meet them and welcome them and offer any assistance that he can. When he reaches the bridge, eventually, they get ready to take off on their mission and jump into slipspace, when they get an alpha message from Fleetcom stating that Reach had come under Covenant attack. Chief McRobb and his crew of the Fermian Sensor Station see an unidentified object in slipspace, and comparing the images to those taken in Sigma Octanus, McRobb realizes it can only be one thing, the Covenant. They enact the cold protocol and alert Reach. They see 300 ships coming toward them. McRobb calms his bridge crew and tells them that there's only one more order to carry out, which is self-destruct more than likely. So because of them, the UNSC might have a fighting chance. John realizes the Pillar of Autumn changed course and calls up to Cortana, not wanting to bother Keys. Keys answers, however, telling him that he will come down to debrief him. He shows John and the other Spartans the memo, letting everyone know that the Covenant had arrived at Reach and everyone is being recalled in order to defend the planet. John doesn't see why the mission needs to be cancelled though, since they are not mutually exclusive. Keyes agrees, and they further agree that if they disable a ship, can get close enough without dying, and they are able to actually board it, Keyes will give Cortana over for them to complete their mission. At this point, John starts ordering his Spartans to get ready for the mission to come. John approaches Kelly and tells her to grab the nuclear mines. Kelly asks if she thinks that there's a trick, like in Mendes's missions, and John tells her that he's waiting for it. Ten small seraphs are attacking the Pillar of Autumn, one is destroyed when they try to avoid an asteroid, but Cortana takes over and is able to maneuver the ship to shoot the rest of the Seraphs, knocking them down and then aiming the Mac gun at a carrier that came in and is trying to destroy them. She shoots at it with the Mac gun, all three shots hitting, the first two downing the shields and the third guts the ship. Ensign Lovell gets them turned and continued towards the Rally Point Zulu to defend Reach. About 100 ships were already around Reach, with 52 additional ships that were inbound, and two repair refit stations that were used as sacrificial shields. Cortana lets everyone know that there is 314 Covenant ships heading their way. Keys couldn't believe it. The UNSC only won battles where they outnumbered the Covenant 3 to 1, not the other way around. Fortunately though, the UNSC have these Supermac cannons around reach. With one shot, they would be able to drop any Covenant ships that would get close enough, and they can reload every 5 seconds, so that's just insane. Keys has Cortana bring up a view of the battle while they were on their way. The UNSC ships sent an opening salvo, and the incoming Covenant vessels did the same. Refit stations moved in to block the plasma, sacrificing themselves. The UNSC salvos collided with the Covenant line. The smaller Mac rounds bounced off shields, but not the Super Macs. That was a different story. The Covenant destroyer was taken out in one shot from it. Also, four nuclear mines were detonated within the fleet, enveloping dozens of ships. Many pushed through unscathed, however. Crazy thing was, over 100 Covenant ships were destroyed, but they'd still doubled the human fleet. Plus, they also seemed to have some new ships that were able to snipe out UNSC ships, a compressed laser that penetrated through every layer of armor on a UNSC ship. After barraging each other, only 20 UNS ships remained and were regrouping at the poles of the planet to defend the 15 remaining Supermac guns. The Covenant main fleet retreated after sending hundreds of dropships to the ground to try and take out the generators that supported the Supermac cannons. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only bad thing that was getting ready to happen. Now we see things from John's perspective. He is listening to radio transmissions from the ground, and things are not going well. On top of the Supermac gun generators being attacked, the Covenant fleet was doing work in space. The aliens were also attacking and boarding Gamma Space Station in order to purge the nav data on board the Oni Prowler Circumference and find Earth. Keyes tells John he's open to ideas. John tells him that they can take care of it. He tells Keyes that he will send three to deal with the Covenant on the space station, while the rest attack groundside and repel the attack on the generators. Keyes thinks it's too risky and should just detonate a nuke to destroy the nav data. But John points out that it's not 100% effective, that the nav data can be destroyed. Plus, the EMP will take down a few of the Supermax. Keyes finally agrees and goes with John's plan. 
Kelly volunteers to lead the space op, but John declines, since he will be leading that, knowing that it will be harder of the two missions. John chooses Linda and James to accompany him on this mission, since Linda was the best long-range shot of the Spartans, and that's what he was counting on. James would also never quit. He had shown that when his arm was blown off. He shrugged it off long enough to defeat the Megalic Golo, or Hunter, that they were fighting on Sigma Octanus. John made Fred Red Team Leader of the ground operation, and he left to get everyone ready to go. They each took off from the Pillar of Autumn, Red Team towards the planet, and Blue Team heading towards circumference. While heading towards the space station, a slipspace portal appeared. John was able to turn off the power to slow them for impact. John's first instinct was to fire upon the ship with missiles and autocannons of the Pelican. However, he realized that that would be in vain. So instead, after passing the frigate, he used bursts of thrusters to try and slow them down before impacting on the station. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough distance for them to slow down, and he yelled for Linda and James to get harnessed up. Once they made impact, the straps John was in snapped. When he opened his eyes, his shields began to recharge, and he checked if Linda and James were all good. They were. They obtained any gear that they could and were on the surface of the space station. John told James to get explosives free of the Pelican while Linda covered them. Just then, Covenant Sanghealy, or Elites, were inbound to EVA. Linda started opening fire, killing a few, and then John yelled to take cover. James was still trying to get explosives free when he was hit with a few needler rounds. Once detonated, his thruster pack shot exhaust out, sending him uncontrollably into space. He tried to fight it, but it was to no avail. And just like that, James would never be seen again, killed by something that he wasn't able to fight. John put him out of mind so it wouldn't distract him from the mission. If they made it out, he would personally make sure every UNSC ship looked for him. John had Linda run to a drop pod for cover while he set up a couple of grenades, since about 100 jackals and six elites were heading towards them. John jumped to Linda and she grabbed him, pulling him into the pod. John told her to fire the grenades on his mark. She did, and that detonated all 20 kilograms of the C-12, opening a hole in the station for them to enter and killing all the Covenant soldiers. With more inbound on their position, they made their way inside and headed for the circumference. As they made their way, they found that four Marines were fighting Jackals and not doing so well. So Linda started firing on the Jackals while John checked their six. Since he thought he saw something on his radar, turns out he was right. A camouflage elite attacked John and fought him off, and eventually John was able to kill him. When he got back to Linda, she was unable to get a clear shot anymore since reinforcements arrived and had overlapped their shields. Keys called to John to see if they had finished the mission, and when John said that they were close, Keys told him that ETA was five minutes. Get it done or get out, so he could do it with the weapons of the Pillar of Autumn, since time was just about out. On board the Pillar of Autumn, Keys notices Covenant frigates jumping in close to the Supermac guns. When arriving, they are powered down for a few seconds, since jumping in systems seems to drain their energy. The Supermac destroys one, Keys destroys another, but not before... Two of the three ships fired plasma torpedoes towards the Supermac. Supermac had destroyed the third Covenant frigate, but it was too late. Both plasma torpedoes vaporized the installation. The Covenant were sacrificing ships to take out the only weapons that posed a major threat. Keys told Dominique to warn Fleetcom of the new situation. Keys also realized that they were getting predictable in sending landing crafts towards Gamma Station and fired missiles at the landing crafts. Just then, unfortunately, the Covenant sniper was back and destroying the UNSC ships trying to protect the Supermacs. Keys orders Lovell to put an intercept course for them to attack that Covenant sniper ship. Cortana wonders what he's thinking, and he wants Cortana to guide them to the ship. If she reads any increase in energy from it, to just use thrusters to dodge the shot. While explaining it, Cortana actually dodges a shot, which is kind of badass. Once in range, they fired the MAC cannons, dropping the shields. They are hit with plasma, but Keys has the section sealed. Cortana flies the longsword with the nuke on board towards the Covenant vessel. Keys has all energy from the engines put to recharging the MAC gun. Once charged, he fires it once again, knocking the shields down, while the longsword crashes into the hull. At this point, Keys needs the shields to hold on the Covenant ship, or else they will die from the nuclear blast, which luckily holds just enough to do that. As they sped past the Covenant ship, they use a slingshot orbit to get around the planet and try to defend Reach. Static came from the channel, and it happened to be the Spartans' ground side. They were unable to hold the reactors due to the sheer amount of Covenant forces overrunning their positions. There's more to why it went south, but that's explained in a future book. So basically at this point, it's a damn near lost cause without the Supermax. There's nothing they can do to stop the Covenants from moving in and glassing the planet. So Keys wants to try and get the Spartans evac John had moved forward to the Marines telling them to tighten up and focus on one jackal at a time. He saw on his hood that the Marines were Sergeant Johnson, we know him, Private Vicente, Private O'Brien, and Private Jenkins. Oh, we also know him. Assuming you've read Halo Contact Harvest anyways. He moved toward them, and they boarded a pelican in the bay next to Circumference. They opened fire on the prowler and destroyed it, and the databass on board as well. The rest of the marines boarded along with Linda, but the door couldn't be opened remotely, so Linda jumped down to open it. After getting the door opened, Linda was attacked from above by some needler rounds. 
hit in the back of the head and chest, taking her out of the fight. John lit them up with the pelican and ordered the marines to jump out and get her inside. Once they were all inside, they evac'd in the Pelican to the Autumn. John sat with Linda, having Johnson take over flight controls, seeing that she was somehow still alive. John told her that the mission was complete, and she said good. They had won, and flatlined right after that. As soon as they docked with the Autumn, he put her in cryo. That way she could possibly be revived. When he reached the bridge, he told Keyes the mission was successful, and wanted to see if they could scan for FOF tags, hoping to find James. However, there was nothing there. John asked when they would be picking up the rest of his team, but Keyes said that they were not going to be able to. The Covenant had already moved in, and extracting him would be impossible for the Autumn. When Chief asked to go alone in a Pelican, he also said no, because they still had a mission to complete. He had to defeat the Covenant in order to avenge his comrades and save the human race. When doing the random jumps, John saw symbols going across the nav console. He recognized it, and told Cortana he did, but he didn't know why. She went through his mission logs and realized that he had seen it before. Still unable to translate it, she decided to see if it matched any star charts. She saw staggering similarities and some differences, but after some more time, she found something 86.2% similar with her navigations. And it just so happened, it followed the code protocol as well. They powered up the slipspace drives and entered slipspace with Covenant close on their heels following them. While on the trip through slipspace, Cortana did a lot of thinking, mostly wondering if Dr. Halsey made it off reach before it was glassed, but chances are, she wouldn't have made it, no matter how smart she was. Their luck wasn't holding out much either, since the Covenant ships had followed them through slipspace. And the chances of losing them were pretty much impossible because they had always been faster and more accurate in slipspace. And wherever they were going, more than likely already had Covenant there. Cortana had woken Keys from cryo sleep and filled him in on the ship's condition. They had two rows of Archer missile pods, 20% power, two Shiva nuclear mines, and no mat gun function. So they were pretty much screwed for combat. Once all the bridge crew was on the bridge and ready, they entered normal space fully powered down to try and stay hidden from the Covenant. Lovell did fire thrusters to get them in orbit around a giant purple gas giant. As they rounded the dark side of the planet, they found a structure, a giant ring with a metal outer surface, 10,000 kilometers in diameter and 22.5 kilometers thick. For most people, we already know that this is Halo, and they figured out that it was artificial, but unsure of who actually built it. So Keyes decided that he would go in and find out. And that's where we leave off, just before Halo Combat Evolved actually like takes place. And it just so happens that Halo Flood is the book version of the game, which will be the next book for summarization. Hope you all enjoyed the summary and learned more about the Halo story. Subscribe to know when more videos come out, and have a nice day. Chick Chang, out.